to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who desperately hopes his marriage can survive the next Rocket League expansion, Mr. Lauren Baumgarten. Lauren! <laughs> What's up, Brent Adams? What's going on, man? How are you? <laughs> Doing pretty good. Doing uh, pretty good. I was tempted. I almost read the. Uh, I almost read the intro today before actually hearing it. I'm glad I didn't. No, because no, no, never do that. It's a true story. That's a true story. My <laughs> marriage may not survive the next Rocket League update, which we are going to talk about oh. in uh, just a little while. On the along with along with uh, a lot of other things, Brent, in the garage things. because we didn't have a show last week. Uh, we're sorry about that. Brent broke both of his legs. <laughs> Uh, in a, <laughs> in a <laughs> I'm sorry. I was not for those aware of this, you, but thank you. For those of you that can't see the video call that Brent and I are currently on while we're recording this, he just about spit Spread up his drink. Red Eagle in the stirrups. Uh, in recovery. Uh, no, bro, we had other commitments, so we weren't able to do it. And so because of that, there uh, since then, there has been the Paris Games Week, uh, and there are a lot of things to talk about. So we're going to do a lot of garage talk this week. We're going to save our clubhouse topic that we had planned for next week. Yep. Uh, but there is a ton to talk about, Brent, starting with... Yes. And this is, this is uh, news that actually came before when we would have recorded last week's show, but still worthy of discussing, and that is uh, three new Star Wars Battlefront heroes have been revealed. And let's see who is it. It's it's Han, it's Leia, and Palpatine, right? Uh, I believe those were the three. Yeah. We all we knew about Boba Fett, uh, though we have gotten Everybody to see some Boba Fett. They know about Boba Fett, but they don't. They don't know about they Boba Fett. And if you they ask don't me, know about Boba Fett. If no. you ask me, there was all there was another reveal in the recent trailers that uh, that I think is just as important, and that is the Sarlacc pit. <laughs> Yes, the only thing that Star Wars gamers have wanted their entire lives is a video game with a playable Sarlacc. <laughs> That's exactly Perhaps right. Perhaps Battlefront will uh, finally answer now, this I didn't first. know it was playable. That is a, That would be an interesting uh, oh, come, thing. So, oh, yes. come on, Lauren. Why would they have the Sarlacc if it wasn't playable? That's <laughs> they, uh, they did go into details about Han Solo, about Princess Leia, Fucking about uh, the Emperor Ovaltine. Um, Jesus. And... Uh, um, uh, we know there's Boba Fett, obviously. We know there's Darth Vader. We know there's Luke Skywalker. Uh, we have seen uh, several more trailers uh, and a little bit more information since that was actually released, Brent. Mm-hmm. But um, the game I did post on OGS, $45 right now on Green Man Gaming, if you're looking to pick it up on PC. Um, I'm thinking about it. But uh, Man, I'm I am I'm it. actually really excited for this game, Brent. I did. You guys are going to give me shit, but I did pre-order it for the one legitimate reason to pre-order something. And that is a financial saving, so I did buy it at $45 yep. uh, because it is $15 cheaper. But I'm actually excited for this game, despite um, uh, what a lot of the OGers feel like. Uh, I did pick it up on PC. Um, Brent, you and I both, we had a good time playing it. Totally. The, the more I had watched uh, some gameplay videos and trailers, uh, the more I'm interested in it, the more I read about the different modes which have been detailed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm excited. And, uh, I, you know, the one thing I have to say, Brent, is... Um, if there is no Cloud City map in the DLC, and if you can't play as Lando Calrissian where your special power is calling in the bald dude to wreck ass, yep. then I will have a problem. But only until that day comes. But that's right. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for it now. I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting jazzed for it. I think it's going to be a good time. What about you? I'm excited for it as well. The only hesitance that I have at all is just about what, what console or, or what platform, excuse me, I'm going to play it on. Uh, where I can play with friends. That, that That's the only caveat I have for it, is just trying to figure out where can I get, pick this up and actually play with some people that I know. And, uh, you know, maybe that's on PC with you and Aaron and uh, some other people. So, yeah, you told me that you got it on Green Man, and I'm I'm seriously considering it. Not pull the trigger yet, but considering it. Um, Speaking of Darth Vader. <laughs> yeah. And the we, Empire. We've got a Konami story. <laughs> so I posted... I posted last week to, to Twitter that uh, the, the story about uh, Konami Konami cor- <laughs> correcting the record uh, in in regards to uh, Hideo Kojima's employment status, uh, and and Konami went out of their way to let everybody know that Kojima is still an employee. He's just on vacation. Hasn't left the company. Just on vacation. This this uh, comes to us via Shack News, and I just 
I just can't what that, understand what the fuck <laughs> what does that is even going mean? on at Konami. I can't even process that information because it makes no sense whatsoever. So, and and this is the thing. Uh, you know, perhaps there is just some Japanese cultural disconnect. But I, I was inundated with people telling me this is where the world. <laughs> this is very common. You know, when somebody when somebody is leaving a position at a company in Japan, they use all of their vacation days at the end, and so it's very. It's it, it it's it does it makes total sense to them that Konami would say this, but I can't understand how this is newsworthy. I mean, I can't like I can't understand Konami telling a news outlet, no, Kojima hasn't left the company; he's just on vacation, without somebody asking the follow up question. But is he leaving the company after that? <laughs> In three weeks <laughs> or whatever? Yeah, or whatever the fuck it is. I, I mean, when like, his vacation time but, runs but out. That's the thing. Konami's statement. Konami's statement makes it sound as if, oh, it's totally just because he and the development team need some time to decompress after this long development cycle, so they're on vacation. It's like, I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but you, know, Konami, you Konami, and Kojima have had one of the biggest public spats in recent memory within the game industry, and so them making it seem like, oh, it's all good, everything's fine, I, it, it, it seems just a little bit bipolar to me. You know what it feels like to me? You know what it feels like to me? Fucking Konami Konami is the Joaquin Phoenix of the video game industry. Okay. They they they're just they they're, it's like they've just gone batshit crazy. Or or whoever you want, pick Randy Listen, Quaid. Okay, well, quit right, pick, like, but now let, look there's a caveat to that though because if Konami wants to start in a documentary where someone may or may not defecate on their face, <laughs> then there could yet be a light at the end of this tunnel. I just don't understand. It's just the, like their actions are so nonsensical. And I'm not talking about like Squeenix nonsensical about how you're selling your fucking game or pricing shit or yeah. EA nonsensical about how you're selling your game. I'm, ta- I'm just talking about like stark raving, just stark raving mad. It, it makes no sense. I, I agree. It, it, it does not. It, it, in no way do I understand what what Konami's angle is in trying to tell people that... Kojima is still with the company, just on vacation. And I, I don't know. I mean, perhaps they are trying to smooth things over behind the scenes. Perhaps they, uh, they're they making some sort of negotiation or something like that. Like, maybe Konami wants to hang on to Kojima. It just, it's just that that would be completely counter to their behavior during the rest of 2015. So, anyway... Um, whether or not Kojima stays with the company past this vacation period, Konami is moving on with more Metal Gear Solid. Now they said that they were going to do this, but it, I think it was it was earlier in the year. It was before it was before the game came out, and it was uh, it was before or maybe around the time that some of the the behind the scenes drama was beginning to come out. But anyway, Kotaku filed a story. Uh, just, I guess that was actually just today, Tuesday, the day we're recording this. Kotaku filed a story that is lifting a quote from a Japanese newspaper in which, Kon- in which Konami is quoted as saying, when we start development of a new Metal Gear title, a large-scale investment will become necessary. And Kotaku is reporting this in the context uh, of the fact that it, it appears now that Metal Gear Solid Five has become this huge hit, sold uh, over five million copies worldwide, that Konami is beginning discussions internally on the development of another Metal Gear uh, of another Metal Gear entry, which ought to come as great, great, enthusiastic, awesome news as far as I'm concerned. And yet, I, I have to say that I am. I'm skeptical, number one. I'm, okay, so the, there's the Kojima thing. Like, is Kojima just done with the series, and who could blame him if he is? Because he's literally been doing it for like 30 fucking years. Um, so is Kojima going to have anything to do with it? Is Konami moving on without it? Is, is it, you know, is, is the next fucking entry a Clash of Clans co- clone for iPhone and Android that, right. that just uh, eats your money, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know. So the point is that... Apparently, more Metal Gear is happening, and I guess we're just going to have to wait and see where that goes. But perhaps, if more Metal Gear is happening, perhaps Konami is somewhat motivated to mend fences with Kojima. Whether that can happen or yeah. not, I don't know. But Yeah, I don't, I, 
I, I don't know. I mean, at this point, who knows? I mean, I, I mean, obviously, they're going to keep minting the Metal Gear franchise. It should come as no shocker to them that Metal Gear 5 was going to sell well. That shouldn't be in any way surprising yeah. to them. What might be surprising to them is if their next Metal Gear game sells well. <laughs> um, but... Uh, so yeah, this is interesting and it comes, you know, as, uh, as the article referred to on the foot of them, you know, supposedly closing some offices, uh, in Los Angeles, who knows? I kind of, again, I I feel like this is, you know, Randy Quaid was brilliant in Kingpin (laughs) and now he's a fucking hermit. And I feel like you're just waiting to see what, what he does. And I feel the same way about Konami. All right. We'll keep, uh, we'll keep our eyes peeled. Uh, next up is something a little bit more easy to get behind, and that is the Just Cause 3 story trailer that, uh, that we have linked here. Well, this is, <laughs> this actually may fit in the realm of doesn't make any sense in the context of, uh, it's a, ju- it's a Just of, Cause game with a story. I, I kind of felt like watching this. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I support the idea that there's a story in here and I think there should be. Yeah. And the story in games like this c- can be meaningful and, and, and meaningful, not necessarily meaningful, like, like deeply thoughtful, but meaningful in the context of your interaction with the game in Saints Row 3 and 4. Yeah. The story is absolutely hysterical and I love it. But I watched this, I, I watched this trailer and I'm super excited for Just Cause 3. Don't get me wrong. But I watch this trailer and I think to myself, why, why, why even bother? <laughs> why even bother putting together the trailer? Half of it is just shit blowing Look, up. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you exactly why. And the reason is the, the reason is the same reason that every '80s action movie starring Schwarzenegger or Stallone or you know the, the, or that that crew, it, it's the same thing. There, you need an excuse for all the explosions. You need some basic premise, even if the basic premise is simply for great justice. You'd need some premise to explain why Schwarzenegger half decapitates a man with a frisbee saw blade. You just you need some. <laughs> there's got there's got to be a legitimate some, reason. You know, thread of adhesive to stick uh, uh, all of these things together so you can have your action uh, movie. And I mean, that's basically what Just Cause Three is doing. They're just saying there's a corrupt dictator, and Rico Rodriguez has to take back this corrupt nation uh, from its government uh, and give it back to its people. Cue the explosion. Yeah, it's which is what that feels like. I, I kind of wish they did a little maybe deeper dive into the characters because one of the things that can really and we're going to talk about this a little bit in Assassin's Creed mm-hmm. when we talk about Syndicate because I've been playing it. But uh, one of the things that can really make a game like this um, better is when the characters are are well fleshed out and like and, t- and in a game like this funny. Yeah. They should be funny. Um, I, I agree. I I th- I think that perhaps the trailer airs a little bit more side on the side of straight drama where it ought to perhaps just acknowledge its sort of cornball lineage. Indeed it should. So anyway, I, I just thought it was odd that there was even a story trailer. But uh, it was a fun moving watch, on, Brent, It was a fun watch. And uh, so moving on, yeah. Brent, we're going to kind of dive into the stuff that came out of Paris Games Week. Let's do that. Um, we're not obviously going to hit everything. There was... Because uh, uh, there was, was tons. Is, is Paris Game Week even... Like, has that been a thing, Brent? Is that... this? I think this is probably the biggest... This is the the biggest slew of news coming out of Paris Games Week that I've never even heard of Paris Games I Week. I don't remember. even did it did, did it ex- is this the first year? Do no, you know? No, no, I don't no, even I don't, I don't even so. know. I'd never heard of it before, but there was a ton of news coming out of Paris Games Week and I was very which I have to say like I, it was very pleasantly surprising. I was not expecting a like a big news cycle out of this thing right. and all these reveals and blah blah blah. It was very cool. Sony spent a lot of time talking about uh, VR. We're going to talk about that mm. in a little bit. Uh, certainly, we're not hitting on everything, but to start off with, we, of course, have to talk about the reveal of the Uncharted 4 multiplayer. Paris Games Week started in 2010, just so you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, any, anybody else heard of it outside of France? Because I, I sure had All right. So, Uncharted, let's talk about what's important, which is Uncharted 4 multiplayer. Yeah, let's talk about it. So, uh, uh, we got to see a lot in the trailer, I thought. Brent, what did you think about what you saw? I guess that everything seemed by the numbers to me up until the end of the trailer when they suddenly introduce artifacts. Not, artifacts, yes. And, uh, and, uh, and Elena is basically sort of teleporting, and Nate is, you know, when she... when she Nate calls up the zombie coffin from the first, uh, yeah, from the the, first Uncharted. I yeah. Um, there's also, I think, those... Um, there's you can call in reinforcements. They come in and like deliver a med pack, or I don't well, think I, I'm not I, sure. Isn't that just like player to player interaction? Like, wouldn't that? No, I didn't think they showed. So they showed one of the. So they showed a bunch of playable characters like Elena, like Sully, Sully 
uh, Nate, Nate's brother, I, Sam, I think is his right. name. Um, playable characters. They did show um, Chloe's in there. Uh, they did show, uh, I and think, Charlie. Elena tossing a med pack yeah. from, uh, you know, f- over to Chloe or something like that. But then I think that there's this, and I think I read something about this, where they call in these reinforcements, too. These, those three players that came up on the split screen in the trailer, I don't think those were playable characters. I think you call them in. Okay. Um, and then I think there's the artifacts thing, and I don't know what the relationship is of all of those things. Um, the point is that the multiplayer has got a little bit more to it. Yeah, it's changed it's for changed sure. A it's got bit. a different. It's got it's got a different feeling to it. It does have uh, at least you know according to the trailer you're going to be doing shit like uh, the swinging yeah, you, that we've seen the, uh, in Uncharted Four, the zip lining thing, the like yeah. like jumping or zip lining into a devastating punch. Uh, I'm intrigued by, so I don't know if these, like, when you see Elena throw, I don't know if these are classes, or if they're pickups, mm. or uh, sort of how they innervate into the game, but I'm intrigued by the addition of these things, but I'm also, um, I guess, I don't know if I would say cautiously optimistic, or cautiously pessimistic. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I feel like a chart of multiplayer has had a pretty good track record so far. It certainly did in the last two. So, um, I, well, that's only existed in the last two. Yes, no, I know, but I mean, I, I don't know. It looks it looks markedly different, and I, I'm curious to see how that plays out. Yeah, I am as well. Uh, but this this trailer, you know, just as a, a bit of a tease for some of the action we might see coming down the pipe when the beta hits, which is what around the first of the year. I don't know. I don't actually know if we know when the beta is, but it can't be. You know, I mean, the the game comes out in March, so right. so whenever the fuck I it would, is. Yeah. All right. Uh, we've got the Detroit <laughs> announced yes. trailer, and if you thought that it was some sort of uh, sad documentary about uh, a city rising from the ashes of its own folly, you're wrong. And if you think it's got anything to do with sci-fi, David Cage wants you to know you're also wrong. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, Detroit is uh, David Cage and Quantic Dreams' uh, newest endeavor, right? For those, so I know this is going to go over like a lead balloon for a certain <laughs> section of people. Eighty uh, percent of the just audience absolutely. just get just hit the <laughs> no, that, button. Don't say it ain't so, man. I mean, I think I, you know. I don't. I was thinking about this while I was watching the trailer, and I see reaction to it on the website and so forth. And I think everybody just gives this guy so much shit and just piles on to like these ga- people that don't like his games. They're fucking quick time games. They're what a pieces of shit. And what I see when I look at David Cage is somebody who's trying to do something, and he may not have it a hundred percent right, or even in your mind, eighty or seventy percent right. But he's trying to do something different with video games, and, and in, in doing so, he's trying to create you know, these powerful emotional experiences and a connection, yeah. and it may take him eight games to get there, but he's, he's trying, and he's iterating, and he's going to get there, and I su- fucking support that, and I think, well, I think you know, in the face of he- heavy criticism from some of the public, I, I laud what he does, and I, think I've liked, I also happen to have liked his games. Yeah, I, I, I but, have too. But... Um, you know he's trying and he's iterating, and each time in he gen- in general he improves upon it, and he's he's trying to figure out you know a different way to utilize the gaming space, and I think it's interesting, and I think Detroit looks fucking great. Yeah, it, it, I'm I'm very excited about it. I, like you, I've I've enjoyed uh, the stuff that David Cage has done so far, and I, I would agree with what you said, and and simply add to it that the the one thing that you can say about Cage is that you can always tell a David Cage game. Like, yeah, you, you look at it, you play it. You know you're playing a fucking David Cage and Quantic Dream title. The the guy and there's not a ton of people in the industry that you can say that about. There are some for sure. Yeah, but uh, the the guy's got uh, the the guy definitely has a vision that he is trying to to execute and trying to innovate on, as you pointed out. And I, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing a little bit more from Detroit. You know th- this trailer. Yeah, just go check it out. You get a feel for what the vibe of it is and and this this idea obviously i I think you know blade runner and things like that kind of come to mind this notion of sort of exploring the nature of humanity and what it means to be human and have human nature and all that kind of thing those those are the those are the themes that that they're kind of telling us they're going to be exploring we'll see more from that as it comes along Mm -hmm. speaking of another company that uh, is definitely blazing its own trail media molecule announced that their new title, Dreams, is going to be coming to PlayStation VR, which is, I think, a pretty, a pretty cool match, actually. Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know how Dreams is going to 
really play. I don't know if it's got this sort of mainstream appeal of something like a little big planet. To me, Dream seems like a little bit more of a, uh, I don't know, maybe like like a risky kind of endeavor. Just because I don't see like the obvious kind of, uh, the obvious sort of gameplay click that the audience can have. Like, oh, it's a, it's a sock puppet and you can do all this stuff, but at its core, it's just really fun platforming co-op gameplay. Where it, it Dreams is it is not that, or at least doesn't appear to be that thus far. No, they started to show off some of the gameplay, and I feel like I need to see more gameplay. I need to see it like uh, enacted in more more uh, vastly different types of dreams yeah. uh, to get a sense of like, oh, here's one that's kind of spooky, or here's one that's kind of ethereal, or here's one that's totally cornball and funny. Right. And, like you know, they need to they need to unleash it upon their community, uh, you know, albeit you know a small beta community, and let them create stuff. I mean, they did start to show how you build connections in some of the worlds. Uh, in in some of the videos that they trotted out at at the uh, PlayStation, or excuse me, at the uh, Paris Game Show, <laughs> the PlayStation Paris Game Week, um, but uh, yeah, it is it is certainly I, I agree with you, Brent. Maybe a less straightforward endeavor uh, than Little Big Planet is, and and a little bit more difficult for uh, people to see the immediate gameplay to it. No. Uh, the interesting thing, though, so it is is we're starting to see, and we're going to talk about another story uh, as we uh, move through the garage today. Uh, 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 content, exclusive content coming to VR. Um, and what that's going to do for fracturing the VR world and how, how important uh, exclusive content is going to be. I mean, I have to say that this this and a couple other titles that Sony has talked about coming exclusively to their VR platform were yeah. very, very compelling to me from a VR standpoint. But the likelihood of me investing in two VR platforms is slim to none as they're each going to cost somewhere in the neighborhood of a console, 400 bucks. Yeah, right. And, be, and that's in addition. No. And that's in addition to your $400 PlayStation or in addition to your, you know, what has to be at least an eight or $900 PC. Uh, if you're talking about the Oculus rift or the, uh, HTC's, uh, product. And Vive. so the Vive, right. So, uh, exclusive content is going to be, an interesting thing on VR, and it's going to be interesting to see how, as VR develops, how that shakes out. Dreams, I think, is a compelling uh, first foray into that exclusive content for Sony. I, I agree. I think that Dreams actually makes a lot of sense as a VR title, as I- at least based on what I've seen of it though, thus far, I see a lot of potential for an experience when it comes to Dreams, and yeah. and certainly that's something that that's something that that could mesh well with VR. Uh, we're going to talk next about the Technomancer, the first contact trailer. Uh, Lauren, you, you're the one that spied this, or, or is this something that came from Actually, the feed at OGR? This came from the feed at OGR. This was not necessarily a Paris Games Week one, but it came from the feed at OGR with the, and I can't remember, sorry, off the top of my head who posted oh, it, but he said essentially lame. the same thing that I said when I saw it was, what the hell is this? Had anybody ever heard of this? Because it looks like an interesting game. It does, and and from out of nowhere, that was that was my, my note to myself. Was like, Where the fuck did this come from? That's exactly right. I never heard of it either. It's being, uh, I can't remember the developer off the top of my head. It's being published by Focus Interactive. Um, it is a um, sci-fi RPG yeah. uh, that I think looks really, really interesting. I haven't done any research on it beyond this. Uh, it, it's not, I mean, it's not really a trailer so much as it is. a. It's, it's kind of like a brief uh, gameplay demo. Yeah, it's like an introduction to the game or whatever, but it doesn't feel like it's the first one. I, I feel like there was media maybe before this. I don't know. Right. Totally not on my radar. Uh, thought it was really interesting. Thought I would throw it out there. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, it's it's a short video, maybe, yeah, just three minutes and change, something like that. But uh, go give it a look. See, it's it's very interesting. There's some some cool mechanics on display, and the the design, the art direction, and kind of the setting and everything being on this distant future on Mars, I think, is yep. uh, is is quite interesting. It, it, it's set. It's set like in a Mars where that I guess you know there was a colony or something there at some point, and then it basically just split off from Earth and uh, and started uh, started becoming its own thing. And then this game is set I think like 150 years after that event. So you know there's been an evolution of technology and culture and so forth in that time. But uh, it does. It looks very interesting. Yeah. So it's coming from a developer called Spiders, which I've never heard of before. Um, and to being published by Focus, and it's supposed to come out in 2016 on PS4, Xbox One, and PC. There so you have it. Check it out. Uh, something that is going to be coming out in 2016 on all of those platforms. Also, 
Well, <laughs> maybe in 2016. Maybe 2016. Is uh, Mirror's Edge Catalyst. And there was an official update on mirrorsedge.com from... And by update, you, they mean delay. Right, for producer Sarah Jansen, who says basically the exact same thing that I said when I told you that episode 40 was going to be delayed. Makes uh, you know all the nice speech about we want it to be the best it can and you deserve the best and blah, blah, blah. And in order to do that, we need time to polish and refine. But uh, the long and short of it is they're pushing the game back to May 24th, 2016. And they're <laughs> that's right. So, but they're very excited. I'm sorry. I'm still laughing. I'm still laughing. They're using the words update because I now now I feel like we're going to have discussions on the website of God. So many games are getting updated yeah, lately. Get ready for an update on episode 41. That's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, the long and short of it is they're very, very excited about the enthusiasm that people have shown for Mirror's Edge Catalyst. And blah, blah, blah. they only get one chance to make it. Uh, the best game it can be, yada, yada, yada. And there's too many games coming out the same week or the week May after. May 24, 2016 is the bottom line. So, yes. I, I don't know. The, the game is so far away, I, it's hard for me to muster any... It's hard for me to muster any anger over this or any disappointment because I, I, I guess it wasn't... I didn't feel like it was close enough to be real yet anyway. And Or, or, well, or maybe I'm like- cynical and assume that the first, the first street date they give me is bullshit. <laughs> it's not really true anyway. Yeah. That's true. There's there's plenty coming out between now and then anyway, so I'm not worried about that either. All right, so the yes. aforementioned Rocket yes. League expansion. Yes. I'm just going to hand the mic to Lauren and let him fill you in. I'm just going to drop it. I'm just going to drop the, it's, it's that. It's that badass. Funk. I don't even need to say it. So, a couple things. Rocket League, uh, Psyonix, the team that uh, developed Rocket League, has announced. Uh, first of which is Mix and Match uh, Cars. Uh, which is interesting. Uh, they're going to have so different cars, and I think you can you can uh, uh, change parts of the cars. I think, um, but more interesting is the uh, update to the uh, oh I don't know game conditions, ball type, uh, and for me the most interesting the addition uh, at least for the winter time of hockey. Yes, so yes, there is that of course. Uh, they have said I did watch. I, I actually you like I, hockey for some reason or another. I do love hockey. Uh, Colorado Avalanche. Thank you very much for asking. Um, I don't watch a lot of developer tw- live stream, uh, Twitch live streams, but I did watch one with uh, Psyonix after this was posted. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did say that hockey is a seasonal thing right now. It's just going to be for the winter. Uh, unless uh, it's played so much that they will keep it. But essentially, there is ice on the ground, and instead of a ball, there's a puck. And it, looks, it changes the gameplay, uh, and it looks freaking dope. Uh, they also uh, will be adding... That's coming in December. Uh, they also will be adding... Uh, different balls and parameters. So, like, they have a square ball uh, that has different bouncing properties than the round one that has now. There'll be different uh, parameters around game types you could set, like, um, like the, different gravity. Yeah, the physics of the ball and... The, right, the gravity with the cars, whether or not you have a boost that recharges. So, I think it's really, really interesting. This game, this company is clearly very passionate about this yep. game. This game has developed a uh, rabid fan base and, uh, again, remains, honestly, a... a uh, I think a contender for some serious uh, esports, and they do have esports going on with it. Um, but it's it's I can sit down and watch a match of this like I would watch any sort of regular sport um, for me personally, um, and look at the strategy and the planning and the talent, and uh, it's really really interesting. And so they care uh, deeply about this game. Obviously, they're introducing new game modes. Uh, these are not going to cost money. They also put a DeLorean in the game from Back to the Future. What the fuck else do you want? Uh, I think that the main thing that we need to say here is that there has actually been an update to this story uh, since we originally posted it, and this kind of speaks to what you were saying, Lauren, about just you know whether or not there was going to be uh, continued interest in this, this seasonal hockey variation of Rocket League. But anyway, I, I'm reading here that uh, Canada, uh, the country, has just changed their national sport to Rocket League hockey. So, Oh, excellent. That could bode well. The Stanley Cup will now go to Rocket League players instead of actual hockey yeah, players. Yeah, well, you know, it, it'll go to actually talented people. Uh, is uh, oh, <laughs> I don't even. Okay, you anyway. know, I let you get away with a lot of shit. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Brad, next up, uh, we got to talk about this. Yeah, yeah man. I, this is I. We it's, got, it's, they're finally it's the thing we've been waiting on. Uh, finally, as a matter of fact, I just saw an article recently about this, and I didn't read it yet about managing the hype around No Man's Sky. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, they finally announced a, a release date, ish. But a release date yeah. for uh, No Man's Sky, and that is June of 2016. Yeah. So, 
a little bit farther off than I was hoping it would be. I, w- I was really hoping it would be closer to, say, March 2016. But um, anyway, it's it's nice to it's nice to at least have a a, a window to pin our hopes to. Now, the question, of course, is in light of the story we were just talking about, do we think that this is a bullshit release date because it's the first release date they're giving us? And or that will they be announcing an update soon? Impossible. Yes, yes. Will there be an update on No Man's Sky coming from Sean Murray? I don't know. Uh, as uh, as as methodical as they've been, and as closely guarded as they've been about about the development of the game, about the release date, and all that, and, and the fact that they they've waited this long considering they started showing like like really started showing it over a year ago not just oh hey we're doing a game called No Man's Sky but uh considering what we've been hearing about the game and seeing more of it for a year i don't know i i tend to think that this is probably going to be the the game's actual release date but that that might just be naive ite I don't know. I don't know why I stretched that out so long, but <laughs> uh, I, I like your pronunciation. Uh, no, I would agree with you, Brent. I mean, I think I I have faith that this is probably going to be the release date uh, for for a couple of reasons. One okay. of them because this is a smaller developer, and they don't tend to typically um, they tend to be better about avoiding the the um, you yeah. know the the missed um, well and and delays. he would fucking also, know. I mean, like if anybody w- was like knew. When the game was likely to be done, it's this guy. And I agree with you because I think, uh, as you talked about, they've been talking about, about this game for so long that uh, I, I tend to agree that this is going to be... And, and it's not a specific day, by the way, which I also thought was interesting. We don't frequently yeah. see them. They, they give themselves uh, just a, a few weeks of wiggle room should they need it. Yeah, I, typically we don't see people giving months, which I kind of like. But I would, yeah. I would, would, uh, I, I feel comfortable that this game will actually come out in June of next year. So I'm excited about it. I'm curious to see. I am too. And I want to read this article about managing expectations because God knows mine are high. Uh, mine are as well, and, and I'm very curious to see. You know, he, he hints it. He hints it. That, oh, you know, there's things that we haven't shown off yet that we're putting into the game, things that have been requested, and I'm very curious to see what those end up being. Indeed. All right. So, uh, Brent, another game that uh, looks like an exploration game, and that was talked about. Uh, this goes back to the PlayStation VR experience and a lot of the talk about wow. VR coming out of Sony was the announcement that Crytek's game Robinson the Journey um, is confirmed as a PlayStation VR exclusive. Yeah, as you were saying, it seems like uh, exclusive content is is going to be the it's going to be the the currency by which VR is uh, is built. It does feel that way, uh, absolutely. In this game, I haven't uh, actually uh, seen any footage of the game, of course, but um, the uh, Robinson, uh, the journey, which which I'm guessing Robinson is somehow related to Robinson Crusoe, um, is uh, looks to be an uh, exploration game with dinosaurs and jungles and that sort of thing. And it looks it's using the Cry Engine, uh, which we all know is an absolutely beautiful rendering engine. Uh, and so I, I this I, I saw this story and I thought, God, there's another game. That I would be really interesting in playing coming from uh, Crytek. Yep. I agree. Uh, and if I choose to get the the Oculus Rift, I will not get to play. That's this exactly game. right. Well, and I guess I mean that's the whole point. Like the whole point of the whole point of console exclusivity is to try to find at least a few things that will get people excited enough to to lock themselves into your platform. For fear that they can't play it anywhere else, and and I have to say, I mean, it does work. The reason I'm still playing PlayStation is because of things like Metal Gear Solid and Gran Turismo and God of War and Uncharted, and th- those those console exclusive series uh, that that I really love have kept me on Sony's platform through multiple generations. Now I've owned one out of the three Xboxes that Microsoft has put out. I've owned all of the Playstations that Sony has put out mostly because of console exclusives. So I, I don't think that they're wrong to do it, but it can be a, frust- it, it can be a frustrating thing if, uh, if you're on the outside looking in. And there have been a few occasions where you know I've seen something on a Microsoft console that I don't have access to, and, and that, can be, that can be a tough break. But I, I guess the reason they do this is because it fucking works. So whether or not that sways you to... I mean, like, would you even consider PlayStation VR or... Is it only going to be PC VR for you? You know, no matter what choice you make within that camp. Well, if you, to be honest with you, Bert, yeah. if you had asked me that two weeks ago, I would have said to you, absolutely, only PC VR. Yeah. Now that I'm seeing what uh, Sony is putting out there, 
I, I would consider it. You know, I mean, there are, for me, uh, there's technical specifications and there is the fact that, you know, one of the pro- there's a fact that I believe that VR is going to go well beyond gaming and very quickly. Yeah. So things like watching movies uh, in a VR plat- in a VR uh, environment, I think uh, that in and of itself is going to be huge uh, in virtual reality. Um, and uh, Oculus has already shown that they're developing the VR cinema. You know, we haven't seen anything like that on Sony. If we did see something like that on Sony, would you then have to buy the movies through the PlayStation Store, mm-hmm. or could I watch any of the hundreds of movies I already have on my well, PC? I mean, it seems to me that like that's going to be an add-on experience to to a Netflix. Or, or a Hulu, um, you know, like a virtual living room to watch TV shows on Hulu, a virtual movie theater to watch movies on Netflix. Right. So, but are we going to repl- are we going to rely on Netflix to build the virtual movie theater choices, or uh, or versus? Why not? I mean, you we, know, you know, we relied on Netflix to to build online movie streaming, and they did a pretty good job at it. No, no, absolutely. But that's, I mean, they've shown no indication that they're building. Uh, they have, they have. Uh, actually, that's not true. They have shown the living room, but I think on the PC there'll be multiple. You know, I could watch 2001: A Space Odyssey sitting actually on the moon, or something like that, which may not be as easily applicable in uh, PlayStation. I also think it's going to go, and that was just an example. But 3D, uh, 360 VR movies uh, themselves, for example, I think people will be playing in that space, and I think they'll be much more readily available on the PC. Websites, web experiences product experiences company experiences i think don't leave out the gonna... mobile platform either i mean you know like youtube right now you know supports vr movies on your phone i mean you know you just you just you know bring up the youtube app you get your phone and you move around and and you're basically looking around inside of you know that that virtual that virtual movie right and so those kind of things i, I you know sony hasn't shown us anything about what that's going to look like on their platform right. so the my point is is i think with vr uh, unlike when you're trying to decide between a Sony and a, I mean a, a, a PlayStation and a an Xbox, especially at this right. point, you're really deciding between the game ecosystem, not necessarily the living room things that go with it. Maybe back in the days of the Xbox 360 and the PS3, you were thinking maybe Blu-ray versus HD DVD. Um, you know, maybe one of them got a Netflix app before the other one. But nowadays, they're they're pretty equitable in that regard. But I think it's a little different with VR. Uh, if it was just down to the gaming content, that's a different story. Um, and so, I, you know, we don't know how this is going to play out. So, but my point is, is two weeks ago, I would have said absolutely PC, no question. After seeing this content, I'm like, shit, really? That looks like amazing content. And Sony knows how to develop games and they know how to develop indie games. And so m- at least my thinking is a little bit like, eh, may- maybe, maybe we'll see. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I agree with you. I, th- I think that, I think the thing that Sony is going to be focused on is games. Uh, and, and that that might be the the important delineation is I, I think that PlayStation VR is going to be very very game focused, whereas I think that VR on the PC is going to be wide open to pretty much anything. Yeah, that's probably true. So we'll see. I mean, this this is certainly compelling, and I definitely you know it's made me take a second look just seeing what I've seen, which is you know I think some the best Sony could hope right. for you know for somebody like me. All right. So the last story up uh, in this uh, very lengthy edition of the Garage is that uh, Sony is moving into esports, and they've announced PlayStation Plus League, which is a new esports platform for PlayStation Four. We're linking to a uh, Games Radar article that uh, has some of the some of the details, but apparently this was discovered by IGN. Uh, ahead of Paris Games Week, I, I guess that there was maybe a, a leak from the official uh, PlayStation page uh, in France. And we know some of the games that uh, that are listed right now, including Battlefield Hardline, Rocket League, Street Fighter 4, FIFA 16, and Project Cars. Uh, there's going to be cash prizes. And I don't know. I mean, I, I guess esports is definitely the thing. Everybody keeps telling me that. But it, it's kind of surprising to me that just all of a sudden... PlayStation is is on board and behind it, and it's happening. I'm actually surprised that uh, it hasn't been done sooner, and I think it's a brilliant move on Sony's part uh, to be the first sort of major console manufacturer to put throw their hat in the ring with regard to this. And while there is a ton of esports out there, um, percentage wise, not much of it is in the United States, and and I think it's uh, smart to. I, I think it could be built up in the United States, and I think it's really interesting that they're going to have their own esports platform, and they're certainly properly positioned uh, to leverage their audience. I mean, they have the captive gaming. Uh, they have a captive 
gaming audience, right? And so um, I think it's absolutely brilliant. It sort of quietly slipped into the news yep. of the Paris Games Week, but I actually think it's a bigger deal than that, and I'll be curious to see uh, long-term how it plays out. And I think that this is great news for you, Lauren, because this means that as your Rocket League addiction slowly destroys your marriage, you can have that great third-act turnaround where the wife actually shows up at the eSports event where you win the prize, get all the money, and then get the girl back uh, to an 80s soundtrack as we roll the credits. So, you know, <laughs> hang on to that dream, buddy. I'm seeing a weird amalgamation of Over the Top and Karate Kid in my head right now. And that is in no way a bad thing. <laughs> Okay, guys, uh, we are going to hit the road and talk about some of the games we've been playing. But, of course, first we're going to visit the poll uh, from last week. And for that, I go to Lauren Baumgarten. Yes, Brent. Uh, last week you posed the question to our listeners, would a hybrid home or portable Nintendo console be of interest to you? The answer shook out like this. With an overwhelming 1% of the yes. vote coming in in fourth place, sounds like an act of desperation. Nintendo needs to give up and do mobile games. Coming in with 22% of the vote in third place, sorry, I'm too busy playing real games to care about Nintendo. Yeah. Coming in in second place with 30% of the vote, not something I'd buy, but it sounds like a good fit for Nintendo. And coming in in first place with 47% of the vote, Brent, definitely, I'd love to see that hardware backed by Nintendo's talent all right well at least some interest from the majority of the outlaw audience and we thank everybody for voting on that poll of course i'm trying to decide what i'm trying to decide what question i want to ask this week i have to zero in on something maybe something to do with like the uh the 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 the, the playstation vr versus pc vr the open versus console thing maybe something like that Anyway, do you think do you think Lauren's marriage will survive? Uh, we all know that's not happening. Anyway, <laughs> speaking of the thing that will wreck your marriage, I, yes. I see here in the road the first item is Rocket League. Well, how could I watch that video of the Rocket League hockey and all the updates and not jump back into the game? Yeah, I, I jump back into it. Logical. Uh, they did. They were doing uh, some objects for Halloween that you could, if you played, uh, you could get like special objects for little baubles for the antenna, uh, different hats, that sort of thing. And so mm -hmm. uh, you had until November second at midnight to unlock those. You, once you unlock them, you keep them permanently. But after November second, they won't be available anymore to those that have not unlocked them. So mm -hmm. I did go in, put some time into Rocket League, unlock some Halloween themed uh uh bling for my car good plan and uh had a good time it's a great it's you know it's a great fucking game i love getting into it you know uh what i really love getting into is metal gear solid 5 again and again <laughs> and again oh my god and it's really interesting man i don't know how many hours i've got at this point it's i gotta be closing in on 200 uh i'm 74 you still have a daughter right I, I i still have a daughter i mean the last time i checked which was two weeks ago but <laughs> i put her in the corner when i started playing i, 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 I put her in the corner fine. with a with a big box of peanuts <laughs> and an epi pen just in case she was right, allergic right. to them uh but anyway i was i was talking actually with my brother and sister about metal gear solid 5 because we were all together, uh, which, which is the first time in a long time that my whole family's been together. And we're all playing Metal Gear Solid Five to varying degrees right now. I'm the furthest along. I've, I'm 70, I want to say 72, 73% overall completion, something like that. And it's so fascinating to talk about this game and sort of because... You know, like my sister is like very, very early in the game. My brother's farther along than that. Obviously, I'm very late in the game. And it's really interesting to kind of talk about how the game experience, like what's important to you about the game early on and how that changes over time. And mm -hmm. my brother and I were talking about the, 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 the mechanics, the game mechanics of Metal Gear Solid are so deep and there's so many layers to be explored within things like the various buddies you can have and the upgrades that you can do to, to buddies, the, the crafting system, the things that you can do to customize your equipment, the different the different kinds of loadouts that you could uh, create for D-Walker, as an example. And it just seems like the game, whether it, whether this is intentional or is just a byproduct of, of what they've created, but it seems like Metal Gear Solid Five is this game that you can play for dozens of hours and have a really good time with, but then... You know, inevitably, it begins to it begins to wane. It begins to feel somewhat repetitive, and perhaps your enthusiasm begins to drop off a little bit. And then suddenly, you discover, oh wait a minute, like I can develop this thing for D Walker, 
And then I could, I could pair that with this, this other, you know, like, like this scout head for D Walker. And that would completely change my play style. Like I, I would, I would do things completely differently if I was going into the field with D Walker in this configuration, as opposed to D dog or quiet. And suddenly you have like this brand new thing that you're interested in and invested in. And that's, that's keeping you going. And then after a while that plays out and then you discover some new thing like, Oh, I don't have to play a snake. I can play as these other characters and they have different stats than snake and they can do different things. And so I'll start playing as somebody other than snake for an infiltration mission. I'll choose this character from the diamond dogs roster and maybe for this assault mission, I'll choose this character over here who's a savage and has these different kinds of things available to them. It's just remarkable. It's, it's remarkable how the deeper you go into the game, th- there, there are things there to find. It, it, it's not just you know some sort of surface experience, but there are things there to, to, to get into and to get excited about and to change the game in fundamental ways that keep you engaged the longer you play. It's, it's remarkable, really, really remarkable. So let me ask you something, Brett, without you uh, spoiling anything okay. for those listeners that, are, that care. Yep. Um, you're, you're not done with the story, is that correct? Well, I, I think I probably kind of am, although I don't know, because I just discovered, like, I, I've, I have completed what I think is probably the last of the main story missions in the game, that really contributes in a substantive way to the story of Metal Gear Solid 5. But you don't know? But I don't know because after I had done that, a friend of mine said, oh, have you gone to this section uh, in, in the medical platform at Mother Base? And I said, no. He's like, you ought to because there's kind of a big story thing there. That you can just find. I'm like, all so right. Do you, so do like, you even- I went to this area in the medical platform. I found a door that opened up. I went inside, and there's like this big cutscene. You're like, holy shit! What the, <laughs> like, what the fuck is this? So that's so. I, I'm look. I, that's so weird because I've I've never. I don't recall ever discussing a game and saying I think I finished the story, but I don't know. I, th- that's um, the thing. I mean, as a, even even open world games tend to be relatively linear in terms of narrative. And this one is decidedly non-linear in terms of right. narrative. So do you do you, and I, I mean this is a genuine question. I'm not trying to be a dick just because uh-huh. I don't like the game. Right. Do you care about the story at all, I, or are you just playing the game to play it? And if things are story missions, then they're story missions and whatever. Two weeks ago, I would have said that I'm just playing the game to play the game. And if they're story missions, they're story missions. And if they're not, they're not. But now I actually am more invested. Like like my parents. I was playing a little bit in front of my family, you know, just because like I was playing, I was in the middle of something. Everybody came over to the house and I was kind of like, listen, you know, just, just let me finish this up and then, you know, we'll hang out. And so anyway, I'm kind of sitting there playing in front of my family and my brother and I who played metal gear on the NES together way back in the day, we kind of got into this whole explanation of what this game series is and, and kind of like the story that's been created through all these different, uh, all these different, games over the year and i have to say that as i get deeper into metal gear solid 5 i care about the story more initially i didn't give a shit about it i really didn't i only cared about the gameplay but now here on you know much closer to the end of it i am more invested in the story and i do think that it's it's pretty interesting interesting i I, that's i i i again i've not heard uh anybody speak of of uh a game and not knowing if they finish it. So, well, but I'm okay. glad. And let me put one caveat on that. Okay, let me put one caveat on that. The story of this game itself is not all that. It's not all that interesting. Okay, it mm-hmm. is. It, it, it is pretty simple. It's just these guys fucked us over. Let's go get them. The story of this game is essentially that. However, in relation to the other the other games in the Metal Gear franchise and that that mythology that has been created going on 30 years now going back to the first NES game the mythology of the game series and all of the things that have happened in this you know this this sort of alternate history that the game explores where metal gear solid 5 fits into that is where it's really interesting i wonder Not if that on its own 
Right. I wonder if that plays into why I'm not, the game hasn't grabbed me because I don't know or give a shit about any of the rest of those things. Yeah. Um, and if by your description, it, it, it's almost to make the story piece at all interesting, you would almost need to know that to you see would. how it fits in the rest of the universe. You would, yeah. And so in the absence of, you know, what little story there is or the way the story is meted out in this game, uh, given that you would need that prior knowledge for even that little bit to be interesting, it, at that point becomes, to somebody like me, it's nothing more than a sandbox. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're not invested in any way in the world, which I'm not, um, the sandbox maybe isn't that interesting, which is sort of how it played out for me. But Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a pretty uh, fair evaluation. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad to know that the onion continues to peel for you, though, mm-hmm. and the layers continue to be interesting at 200 hours. I mean, that's amazing. You've gotten yours and my money's worth. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm glad somebody did. All right. Uh, my turn, Brent, to talk about what I have been playing for the last two weeks. I'm very excited to talk about it because um, I think it's an interesting game, and that is Assassin's Creed Syndicate. All right. I'm, gonna, I'm, sitting, I'm settling in for this because I want to hear about it. Uh, so I'm happy to report to you, Brent, that for the first time, the first time in the Assassin's Creed series, <laughs> I am pleased with my purchase, uh, which is not true. I actually quite enjoyed uh, Black Flag, but I enjoyed Black Flag. The, my relationship to Black Flag was an odd one because I absolutely loved the game when I was on the boat, yeah. but as soon as I got off the boat, I hated it. <laughs> um, so it was kind of a weird one. But um, I, I have been very pleased to this point with Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Um, and here's why, Brent. So, first of all, let me preface this by saying this is an Assassin's Creed game. So, many of the things that may bother you about previous Assassin's Creed games may bother you in this game. However, Mm -hmm. um, almost all of them, in my opinion, have been improved upon. Um, at least slightly. It is, again, it's you, still an just, assassin. Just talk briefly about some of those things. Like, what are we talking about? Like, fight system, pacing? So, all of it. Uh, the fight system, uh, is fight system, pacing, uh, how side missions are set up, the, just the collectibles in the game, and, and how the map has been historically, like, overwhelmingly littered with them, uh, the parkour system itself, and how you sometimes find yourself running or jumping up and onto things you maybe don't want to, um, uh, the characters, um, the performance of the game, the like all of those things that may have bothered you in previous games, they're all improved upon at least slightly, if not significantly. Okay. Um, traveling around, vehicle systems, um, all, all of that stuff has gotten better. So, um, so the music, the everything. So let's talk about that a little bit. So, um, but it is still an Assassin's Creed game. And if you ask me, it was interesting because I actually went to Reddit and started reading some of the Reddit, uh, um, uh, the Reddit entries for Assassin's Creed. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other piece that has improved dramatically, from my opinion, is the uh, future Assassin's Creed stuff or the present day Assassin's Creed stuff. Right. Um, that's something that used to annoy me as well. Yes. There's sign- I've been playing. Uh, my guess is at this point, I have probably played. 20 hours or so, maybe, I'm ballparking, because okay. there's no counter, 20 to 25 hours of the game, and I have interacted with the present day or future two times, that entire time. And both times, it was a cutscene that lasted about two minutes, and both times, those cutscenes were far less annoying than the previous cutscenes. Right. How much, how much at future gameplay Zero. takes place? So it's just cutscenes. Correct. Which, uh, which, uh, when I'm I went to Reddit, I'm totally fine with that. I was very surprised to hear how many people were pissed about that and wanted more future gameplay. For me, I believe it to be a significant improvement in the game. Yeah, I, I agree. I, th- I think that uh, you and I might be in the minority on that, but I, I totally I, agree. I bet we're not. I bet the the vocal. I bet it's a vocal minority the other way around. But you spend ninety nine point eight percent of your time, or nine ninety nine point nine percent of your time, in the era in which the re- is the reason you bought the game in Victorian London, right? Uh, which is how it should be. Yeah, no kidding. Um, the game is beautiful. Uh, all of the ref- there's all the streets have tons of reflective water, uh, as is the hallmark of this generation. Yeah, um, the city is enormous. So it's, wet. it's like it, like it's, it's fresh <laughs> fresh rain. Yes, fresh, exactly. Freshly rained everywhere. <laughs> That's exactly right. The sun's which shining every- though. Sun's not shining though. Every game seems to be fresh rain. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, because that is the hallmark of next gen gaming. Yes, it is. Um, so uh, the game is absolutely beautiful. The characters are better. The two lead characters, Jacob and Evie Fry, uh, is a brother and sister from, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head, Crowley or something like that, okay. uh, outside of London. 
Um, they make their way into London, and uh, they are the assassins, and they're fighting the Templars. They do it in two different ways. Jacob tends to be a brawler and wants to go out and fight and kill the Templars. Evie is looking for part of the Shroud of Eden, which I don't remember what that is from the previous games, and frankly, I don't give a shit, and, and it doesn't matter like in the context of this game. They have slightly different play styles. Jacob's more of a brawler. Evie is more of a stealth. There's skill trees uh, that you can build out on them um, that you will eventually um, probably fill, finish building out on both of them, no matter what. When you earn skill points, they both get that amount of skill points. So every time you get one, they both get one. And Evie has three or four things that are specific to her that make her more stealthy. Jacob has three or four things that are specific to him that make him more of a brawler. Um, but the important thing about these two characters, to me, uh, is the dialogue. They are uh, f- funny. They are witty. They exchange uh, witty repartee sometimes, the way they talk to. The actors do a fantastic job. And they make for two, in my opinion, very interesting lead characters. Um, additionally, all of the side characters, I find them to be well-acted and interesting as well. One of them in particular, Alexander Graham Bell, has a larger of the roles of the sort of side characters. Yeah. He's central to the main story, whereas the sort of Charles Dickenses uh, and the Karl Marxes and those are sort of those are side missions. Mm-hmm. Um, Alexander Graham Bell is central to the story, and he's uh, very well-acted and very funny uh, and a super interesting character. The enemies are much more interesting. The bosses, Steric, who is the main boss, is a much more compelling enemy. So, from I mean, a story standpoint, it's very similar. In the you know, it's assassins versus templars, but the characters themselves are more interesting, and there's more more of them are interesting than has been the case in previous Assassin's Creed games. Um, the uh, s- some of them, in particular, like Charles Dickens, for example, your missions with Charles Dickens all end up being ghost hunting missions which are sort of totally not associated with the story, really. But they're these random ghost hunting missions at night. They're all at night in in 18th and 19th century Victorian England. How interesting. And it fits perfectly, and it's awesome. And I can't wait. That sounds really cool. They're doing a a Jack the Ripper DLC, which I will probably buy. It will fit perfectly. I mean, that's a given. Come on. the, the, The detail they talked about, I watched one of the videos where they said this is one of the first Assassin's Creed games where they really had a lot of photographs of the era that they were trying to recreate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been watching recently, I've been watching Sherlock, the BBC um, uh, series, which is fantastic. And also uh, Penny Dreadful, which takes place in Victorian on Showtime, which takes place in Victorian London. And it's so interesting because like all the details in this game of like the lanterns on the side of the carriages and that sort of thing are just, they're brilliant and they're spot on. And it's really, the atmosphere is fantastic. So, um, so that part is vastly improved upon, in my opinion. The combat, while certainly not as good as Batman uh, or even maybe sleep and, or Sleeping Dogs, has gotten much better. Okay. It's brutal. Um, enemies will attack you while other enemies are attacking you. Um, it's still, you know, uh, you know, some people have referred to it as button mashing. I'm not sure. Like, I don't know. It just that feels like. A, that. Well, I mean, I, I don't understand the distinction between like Batman is also button mashing technically right you just yeah. it's the order in which you mash well, the buttons uh, yeah I, I don't i mean to me button mashing denotes a certain sort of mindless like you know just slapping buttons not really caring what you're doing and that's the whole point of the to the batman combat system is that it is it's it's parry and attack parry and attack you know uh, this is the same thing there so there's there's a parry button just like in batman yeah. the, the the triangle and an attack button there's only one attack button um, they they tried to mimic Batman in that they have the like there's a regular foot soldier then there's the brute the one that you have to parry mm. right the one that, just like in Batman where you have to do a cape stun in order to fight them um, now Batman takes it one step further and has the there's some you have to cape stun and there's some you have to run up and jump on right. the guys with the shields uh, Assassin's Creed only has one you know type of you have to parry there's not two different kinds of parries um, so it's less complex than Batman, but it's still fun, and entertaining, and absolutely brutal. They're using environments now, so you can push guys up against a, a wall and use the environment to kill them. There's much, there's many more finishers, and uh, so that I think is improved upon. Traversing the city, uh, you know, <laughs> there's there's a great video out there that talks about how Batman gifted the grappling hook to Jacob and Evie Fry. <laughs> Because now it's got the rope launcher, which yeah. is essentially the grappling hook. Look, you gotta, you um, gotta have that. I mean, come on. But it's well implemented. Uh, it's ah. well implemented, and it helps. Uh, it helps the tra- traversal mu- a lot. Uh, likewise, I really, I thought I would hate the carriages, partially because I saw some uh, previews of the game in which people just could not control them, and I've re- come to realize it's just because they suck. 
Um, I really enjoy the carriages now. Like you can, you can cover a lot of territory with the carriages and they're fun. Um, so that, that piece of it is improved. They have the map is far less littered with just bullshit collectibles. They are out there. Um, but it's less littered and, and, uh, you don't necessarily need to do them. So here's my suggestion for gameplay. If you don't already know this with Assassin's Creed syndicate, and I actually got this suggestion from, um, an, another article I was reading. And that is, so now, interestingly enough, there's less of viewpoints. Okay. okay. Uh, each there's six, I believe six sections in, um, in the London area that you can, uh, in, in which you can play London, um, Whitechapel, Westminster, uh, the Strand. The, those are different areas. Within each area, there's the Thames. Uh, there's usually two or three viewpoints. Once you unlock the viewpoints, you then unlock the sort of major, um, I should say, I don't know, challenges or missions. Like they might, And it's usually one of like three or four things. Uh, one of them is to kill a Templar. Sometimes it's to... Um, uh, kidnap a Templar. Sometimes it's to free children from a factory. There's like four things, right? Okay. Once you do that, you have you have um, freed that area. So until the viewpoint is shown, the area is sort of cloudy on the map. Once you show the viewpoint, the area the clouds clear, and you can see those main sort of uh, missions. Once you do those main missions where you free the uh, free the people or whatever, um, then it goes completely clear, and now uh, you can begin to take that section. Once you've cleared all of the sections of, say, uh, the Strand, for example, um, you can then, you have a gang war, which is nothing, uh, and you now have taken over that section. And so it's not like Blighter territory. Blighter is the uh, the um, London gang that, that uh, the Templars are utilizing to control the territories. So, um, and it actually works out pretty well. And so the suggestion I read was go in, do your viewpoints, do these few things, free up those areas, then worry about the story missions. And so right. I'm actually way ahead uh, <clears> in <throat> terms of my rank. I think it goes. you can rank up RPG-wise to rank level 10. I'm like a level 8 right now or 9, but I'm only on sequence 6 of the story out of 8. And so um, sometimes I'm a little bit of, uh, overpowered, um, but it, it's uh, it, it sort of it worked out okay. And so... Um, yeah, man, I'm really enjoying this game. I mean, it is an Assassin's Creed game. It, the I love the atmosphere. I Sometimes I go in and I just do these mindless missions where I'm sort of trying to take back control of this part of the city. Sometimes I go in and do story missions, um, just depending on how I'm feeling. Uh, and I really enjoy it. And I'm actually enjoying it overall more than Black Flag because I think that, um, like I said, Black Flag really failed when you stepped off the ship, and that was a good portion of the game. Uh, this game, the whole game just seems to work better. Um, and I, maybe the first Assassin's Creed that I actually finished the story. I think it will be. That's, uh, that, that's high praise indeed right there yeah. coming yeah. from. I really, I really wish that this is, this is what Assassin's Creed one or two should have been. Yeah. Uh, and if they were what we would have now in the ninth installation, instead of fatigue is an, an outright amazing game. If this had been the starting point, they could have really been refining the combat to to be competitive with like a Batman, right? Um, and uh, they could have really been working on refining their like how their stories progress. So, um, but it's a it's a f- I'm totally enjoying it, man. I mean, on a scale of one to ten, would I give it a ten? No, not necessarily. Um, but I'm absolutely enjoying my time in it. And if it's something I-, I can say, I think without hesitation that if it interests you. Um, I think you would enjoy it. It is it is the best of the Assassin's Creeds that I have played. Pretty cool. Yep. All right. Well, let's go ahead and go into the sunset. And I'm going to start off with just a, a a little jewel of Halloween delight that uh, was shared on Kotaku and has been uh, been making the rounds on YouTube. I'm sure you probably have seen it at this point. But if not, you want to go and uh, check out this fantastic video that imagines. The Evil Dead Army of Darkness, which is one of the greatest movies ever made, if it had been a Metroidvania game on the NES. 8-Bit Cinema uh, put this out, and it is, it's freaking awesome. It, it, you, you'll watch it, you'll laugh, you'll cry, and then you'll cry some more because it doesn't actually exist. But it is a lot of fun, and if you're a fan of the, uh, the Raimi Evil Dead films and Ash, which I am, then you definitely want to go and check this out. And you might also want to check out the uh, the new TV series, Ash vs. the Evil Dead. 
I, I hear good things about it so far over on stars, I think. All right, so my Into the Sunset, Brent, is a little bit different. Mine is about Austin Wintry, uh, and the reason that I came across this was because Austin Wintry is scoring um, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went to his website just to check it out, see if it was available, and in the, con- in the uh, context of doing that, I discovered something that I was unaware of, and that is that Austin Wintry offers uh, sort of a membership to his website over there at Bandcamp. It's $20 a year. Yeah. You get uh, access to uh, stream and or download 16 of his previous uh, titles and all of his new music as it comes out in the future over the course of the year Cool uh, for 20 bucks. And I thought that was actually really cool. You know, I love me some Austin Wintry, so I wanted to put this out there to the OGS community who might also be fans of Austin's uh, and to, so, to not only give you access to his music, but so you can support him directly. No doubt. All right. Uh, in our ride-along, Brent, we have what I think is an interesting topic. This comes from Shurikin, as I'm assuming how you pronounce it. Could be Rickin, but I doubt it. Shurikin. Uh, Shurikin writes, hey, guys, I would, like to, I would like to please submit a ride-along to Square Enix for releasing the first 27 minutes of Rise of the Tomb Raider, purely due to the fact that I refuse to ruin these moments for myself by watching this video. I will never understand... The publisher's strategy of allowing users to view the opening moments of a game prior to experiencing it for themselves. When I think about some of my favorite opening sequences in games, Arkham Asylum, God of War 3, The Last of Us, I can't help but wonder if my final thoughts on these games would have changed if these key moments had been experienced out of context. Does this form of marketing bother you guys? Also, as I feel these moments in the early stages of a game can be equally, if not more impactful than the ending in cementing a final impression. All the best from Scotland, Ricky. Um, Brent, I, 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 uh, I think this is a fantastic point. You know, we have kind of alluded to this before, and I do think that this is, uh, an absolutely horrible marketing tool. And I do think that, uh, it does ruin the game. And actually, uh, I don't know if you remember Ricky, but in the uh, previous Tomb Raider game, they released the opening cinematic as a trailer and everybody thought it was the trailer. Uh, and then I went and we, you know, we loaded up the game and we find it's the one with Laura, like, uh, on Laura the, on the ship. Right, jumping across the breaking ship, and it was so dramatic, and it was so awesome. And when we went and fired up the game itself, it was completely, uh, completely a letdown uh, because we had already seen it. And I, I, th- I agree with you 100%. I think this is a terrible tactic. I think it's, it is equally, uh, and I think articulating it as that being equally as important as the ending, I think is absolutely true. Those opening moments of a game can sometimes be some of the most powerful moments of the game, and I think it is a bad, bad idea to let them out ahead of time. You know, for me, I, I can think of situations where it's bothered me more than it has in other times. There, there's games that this has happened with that I haven't particularly cared about, but you know, we have talked about that whole that, that whole effect of going into the game and feeling, you know, and this goes for demos as well. You know, like, like where the demo is, you know, just the first, the first chapter of the game or whatever and how it it really does ruin that that initial sort of buy-in that that you're trying to have with the game and it's like well i've already done this because i played the demo or the beta or i've already seen this because i watched the trailer and 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 you end up being kind of bored in that first part of the game just trying to get past it and and so like i said it's it's situational for me like I, i i i don't feel like it's it's always the worst thing ever but i can definitely think of situations Tomb Raider is a, a good example where it has really, really uh, been a negative overall on the uh, the game experience. So, yeah, excellent point. Yes, and thank you for writing in with that thought, Shurik, and we appreciate it. And, Brent, I think that brings us to the end of another show. At last. At last. Um, with that, we Says will turn it audience. over. We, that's right. We will turn it over to you guys to comment on what we talked about this week, whether it's the point that Shu Rican brought up with releasing the first part of a video game, whether it's Army of Darkness as an NES game, Austin Wintry's membership, please uh, go check that out. Uh, in the Road, we talked about Assassin's Creed Syndicate, Metal Gear Solid Five, and, of course, a little bit of Rocket League. Uh, and up in the garage, we talked about a lot of stuff, including PlayStation Plus's new eSports league, uh, Crytex Robinson, the journey coming to PlayStation VR, No Man's Sky release date, Rocket League's upcoming uh, updates to their games, the update, speaking of, on Mirror's Edge Catalyst with its delay to May, the Technomancer, Media Molecule's dreams coming to VR, the announcement of Quantic Dream's next game, Detroit, Uncharted 4 multiplayer, Just Cause 3 story trailer, whatever the hell is going on at Konami, and three new heroes in Star Wars Battlefront, among other things with that game. Please 
sound off on any of these topics and anything in the world of gaming that you want to add to the conversation. We are always grateful. As usual, he is Brent Adams. I am Lauren Baumgart. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing.